by uh, you'll be our speaker. Um, uh, the last thing I'd like to say before we turn it over to Steve um, is that um, regarding Macau, um, Macau uh, 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 is uh, um, funded uh, in, in a very minor way by by uh, contributions to to Australia, Australian Mathematical uh, uh, Society. And uh, if you'd like to join uh, Macau and help support our activities, um, you can uh, do so by contributing or signing up to be a member of Macau when you pay your dues to the uh, Australian Mathematics Society. And uh, we'd uh, welcome more members if, you, if you'd like to support activities like the one that we're, we're doing today. Okay, so uh, over to you, Steve. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thanks uh, very much, Andrew. And um, I just wanna show off our beautiful uh, lake and sailing club here in, at, at the university that I'm a very proud member of. This picture was taken on July 3rd. It was a particularly spectacular sunset that day. And um, uh, yeah, it was one of the few days I couldn't get out sailing because the wind wasn't very good. Anyway, so um, let me, uh, I, I guess I've got an hour. Andrew, how long should I actually talk for? Um, look, uh, we, we can, um... You can use most of the hour. You know what I mean. We'll uh, okay. reserve a little bit of a little bit of time just at the end for a few questions. But uh, this is more of a lecture series, so I, don't, I think we can uh, devote most of the time to the, your work. Okay, so I'll leave a few minutes at the end. Uh, I've got two more lectures after this same time, I guess uh, Tuesday, Wednesday. So um, I've got two decks of slides. This is the first one, and this one overlaps quite a bit with the talk that I gave. I think in Wombat last uh, November or December. And so apologies if you've seen many of these slides before. It is a little bit different, but um, there is quite a bit of overlap with that. The second deck is, uh, the second deck has to do with uh, algorithms. Oh, let me turn my pen on. Um, and that you have probably haven't seen before. And that's a quick run through of a bunch of algorithms that are, you know, popularly used in uh, optimization formulations of data science type problems. Um, so in the first deck, which is this one, and we're not going to get through all of this today, so it'll probably take me, you know, one and a half or almost two lectures to do this first deck. I'm going to run through about 15 problems in data science. I call them applications here, although that's a little bit, they're not all applications. Some of them are like formulation techniques. Um, and then I'll talk about one issue. The issue is non-convexity which is an issue that's been coming up a lot more in the last six or seven years. Um, and then I'll say a little bit about neural networks. Now, the other two speakers in this series are gonna say more about that. Um, and, uh, but I don't think there's gonna to be too much overlap between what I say and what they say. Uh, in, in any case, it doesn't hurt you to get a, you know, several different perspectives in that area because it's such a, a huge and a very topical area these days. Um, and I should say, this is all fairly, um, uh, you know, this, this isn't so much cutting edge research. I'll, I'll touch on cutting edge stuff here and there, but mostly it's kind of foundational, fundamental type stuff. So, um, but I'm happy to, if you look at the reference list, you might get some pointers to, lit to the current literature. Also, if you Google things that you're interested in, you're sure to turn up a bunch of papers that are uh, potential relevance. Uh, these are two particular sources that I'm using. There's this book um, that just came out maybe six weeks ago, which was a long time in preparation. Uh, it's, a, it's a book I uh, have with Ben Recht. Um, I use chapters of it to teach graduate optimization courses. So it's got a lot of, uh, you know, fundamental analysis of optimization methods in it. Um, but partic there's a particular bias towards methods that are useful in data analysis type applications. And the second source is a paper that I published in this volume. It came out in 2018. I actually gave the lecture in uh, 2016, I think, in Park City, Utah. And it was, um, it was kind of a summary lecture of, uh, you know, several applications of data science where optimization is useful and then running through a bunch of the fundamental techniques, deepest descent, accelerated gradient, stochastic gradient, Newton's method, and so on, uh, augmented Lagrangian, and so on. So I'm using those two things as sources, uh, many other sources too, of course, but um, you know, th these are 
uh, I'd recommend getting hold of, of uh, these things if you want to go a little bit deeper and look for some more references. I've got to say, this book isn't that well known. I'm quite proud of the paper that I contributed to this volume, but it's almost invisible. I, I think very few people have seen it, but I, I think it's um, a, you know, quite a concise summary. And I'd recommend trying to get hold of it if you can. Okay, so let me give some context first, and I'll start by talking about what is the relationship between uh, data science and optimization, and what is data science? And there's a statement that I made maybe about 10 years ago that's been picked up by quite a few colleagues who, who, who uh, kind of amplify it, and that is that the field of optimization is being revolutionized by its interactions with machine learning and data science. These fields are throwing up a lot of interesting new paradigms, really serious, large problems that urgently need to be solved. And it turns out that uh, optimization tools are exactly what they need in many cases. So this has given rise to new algorithms in several areas, but it's also given rise to revived interest in a lot of old algorithms that have been no known in some cases for up to six decades, um, in some cases, you know, two or three decades. So as I mentioned, data science and machine learning is throwing up sort of challenging formulations and some new paradigms that I'll, I'll talk about in a lot more detail. Um, it's sort of caused a, a renewed emphasis on certain topics that had sort of, to some extent, in some cases, fallen by the wayside. So these include things like convex optimization, which of course has always been a big deal. The area of complexity, which I would say was not really a mainstream area of interest in, um, in the you know, traditional optimization community until fairly recently, the last 10 years or so. Although, of course, there were some pioneers in that area that have always been active in uh, optimization, like Nam Morosky, for example. This idea of problems with structured non-smoothness, uh, and I'll talk a lot more about that. Um, Non-convex -con optimization has really come to the fore in the last eight or 10 years. This uh, famous stochastic gradient algorithm, or SGD, as many of you know it by, uh, that's been around for 60 years, but that really is the workhorse of large areas of machine learning and data science. And augmented Lagrangian is an approach that, of course, it was invented in the 70s by some of the leading lights in optimization, like Terry Rockefeller, Magnus Hestenes, uh, Dmitry Bertsakis contributed greatly to it, uh, Congul and Twine and others. But it's sort of the work in that area didn't really, it, it sort of came to an end in the early 90s. And then people kind of lost interest in this largely, but it's really come to the fore again in machine learning. It's turned out to be a very useful tool in several areas of machine learning. So in summary, there's a large community now working at the interface of machine learning and optimization. And um, you'll find if you go to a lot of the top optimization conferences uh, like ISMP and uh, SIUP, unfortunately ISMP hasn't been held for four years now, but it is going to be held in some sort of remote fashion in, in a few uh, weeks. There's another conference called ICC Opt, which is going to start in two weeks, uh, International Conference on Continuous Optimization. That's going to have a big presence in, uh, there's going to be a lot of data science ML talks there. And then the big uh, machine learning uh, conferences, NeurIPS, ICML, Colt, ICLR, AI Stats, um, they always have a very big optimization component these days. And then the journals, JMLR, Journal of Machine Learning Research, which is probably the top journal in machine learning, and then Math Programming and SIOPT and other leading optimization journals. You'll see quite a few papers in those venues that address problems at the interface of optimization and ML. And I should say, if anyone has questions, I'm not sure what the protocol is, but if you put your hand up, I think I'll be able to see it. Um, and feel free to unmute yourself if you can and ask, okay? Because we have a fair amount of time here, so. Okay, so I wanna say a little bit about, I wanna define terms a little bit. So data science has been a term that's been used a lot during the last five years. There are other terms that are not the same thing, but they're related. So things like AI, machine learning, data analysis, statistical inference, learning theory, they're all a little bit different. Some are wider, some are narrower in certain senses, um, but they all have kind of a common mission. And that is they try to extract meaning from large collections of data. That's one sort of important thrust of all these areas. 
uh, they want to learn sort of important features of the data, fundamental structures that appear in collections of data. And the second thing is they want to use that knowledge to make predictions about other similar data. So to be able to make inferences about data that sort of looks the same as the data that you're studying, the data in your collection, but might be a little bit different. So this, this is a very multidisciplinary area. It's certainly got its foundation in statistics and still draws heavily on statistical principles. There are a lot of areas of computer science that touch on data science. So AI is traditionally a computer science area, machine learning, uh, data mining, these have been around for a long time. But then there are also these systems areas like databases, parallel systems, and architectures, which are other areas of CS, but they become, become very relevant in modern data science because you need to be able to curate large collections of data. That's where databases come in. The computational problems you have to solve are very, very large and onerous. So the only way you can really do them or quite often is on, is on parallel machines. Um, also for reasons of privacy and security, you might want to use parallel uh, systems for those reasons as well. And nowadays there are special purpose architectures that are being designed just to train neural networks. And of course, GPUs are, are, are very important in that as well, graphical processing units. There are now libraries for training neural nets that run on GPUs as kind of a standard thing. So the case that I'll make in the rest of these um, talks is that optimization provides very valuable tools for, uh, for modeling and formulating machine learning problems as computational problems that you can actually then go and solve. But it also provides the algorithms that are very useful for solving these methods. So in some cases, data science is very closely tied to the applications that, that give rise to these collections of data. So in speech and image processing, video processing, uh, natural language processing, the way that data science is used in those areas is very closely tied to the applications. Also in robotics, these are all areas that where the data science is really meshed into the application. And there's this quote that I, I want to mention. Uh, uh, it's now almost 20 years old, but the quote is that 80% of data analysis is spent in the process of cleaning and preparing the data. And of course, we're going to be talking mostly about these other 20%. We're going to assume that the data is kind of in a nice, clean collection, ready to be, to, to be dealt with. Um, but it's important to bear in mind that most people that work in data science, in industry, in government, uh, and so on, are really in the process of, of cleaning up the data and getting it into a form where it can be analyzed and getting it into databases, getting it, uh, making it easily accessible, and so on. So there's a lot more to data science than, than what I'm going to talk about here. Okay, so let me give you a very high level definition of, you know, kind of the, the paradigm that underlies a lot of what I'm going to talk about, a sort of a typical setup. So after we've done all this process of cleaning, formatting, archiving, whatever the data, we're going to often end up with a set of, say, M objects. And each of those objects will consist of a vector of features, AJ. You can think of it as just a vector, often of real numbers, but sometimes categorical features like binary zero one variables or integers or whatever. So that's gonna be one thing. Each, each of these M objects is gonna have a vector AJ and it's also often gonna have a label YJ that matches the AJ. So what is this YJ? Well, it could be a real number, okay? And these give rise to what's called regression problems. So you wanna be able to look at the vector AJ ultimately and make a prediction of what the YJ label will be. And you're going to do that on the basis of looking at this collection of NP M pieces of data and using that to learn uh, how to get from the uh, feature vector to the label. The label could also be uh, uh, an integer, say between one and M. And this, this sort of thing arises, for example, in image classification. So one of the very standard problems in, in, uh, in data science is, uh, is one of the standard data collections is ImageNet and similar problems, which, which are huge collections of images of objects. And uh, the label tells you what's in the image, whether it's a watermelon or a, a donkey or a monkey or a jet airplane or whatever. So obviously M could be very large in that case. It could be in the thousands. Uh, there can be problems where there are multiple labels associated with each of the AJs. So you could classify the feature vector AJ according to several different criteria and have a separate label for each of those criteria. 
There are also interesting problems where there are no labels, where all you've got to work with is the feature vectors. So these include problems like subspace identification, where all of these AJs lie in some sort of low dimensional subspace or low dimensional manifold. And you're trying to learn what that subspace or manifold is by looking at all the AJs. Also clustering problems, very standard problems in data science that go back you know, 50 years or so. And the story here is we often don't, we don't have labels in clustering problems. So all we've got are the vectors, but we want to sort of figure out how to group the vectors into subsets. Each subset's called a cluster. Uh, the hypothesis being that each cluster has kind of similar properties in some sense. So we want a systematic way of grouping the AJs into clusters. So they're interesting problems even without labels. But most of what I talk about are problems that have labels of some kind. So the fundamental data analysis uh, task is to learn a mapping that takes you from the AJ to the YJ, if there is a YJ. So in other words, you want to learn some function phi where you plug AJ into phi and it gives you a prediction of what YJ is going to be. Now, you, you might also want phi to satisfy some additional properties. Uh, and the most important one probably is it to be generalizable. And what we mean by that is that it should work well on other feature vectors, A, that are not in this collection of data that you're working with, this collection of M data items, but they look similar to data, uh, to vectors in that collection. So when you've learned this, this, um, this mapping phi, it should continue to perform well when you plug in other similar kinds of data vectors. It should give good predictions of the label for those. But there might be other properties. You might want phi to be uh, other related properties. You might want phi to be as simple as possible in some sense, you know, not an overly complicated function. Uh, one that's just complex enough to, to do a good job of matching the data, but, but no more complicated than that. So very often we can define this, this function phi in terms of, of some parameter vector x. And when we've done that, we've, we've turned this, this problem into a data fitting problem. The problem then becomes, let's find the x that parameterizes phi such that phi of aj and x gives you yj or gives you a good approximation to yj most of the time, okay? So we can turn it into an optimization problem that way by finding the x that sort of satisfies these conditions. Now, very often, as we'll see uh, during the rest of these talks, the objective function that we have to minimize to find the x is a summation over these M terms, where M is the number of items of data. So essentially you've got what's called a loss function or an objective function associated with each AJ, YJ pair. And of course, it's gonna involve the vector X. And so, and your objective, the overall function that you wanna minimize is the summation of the M terms, each term corresponding to one of these items of data. So there's a lot of structure already because this M can be very large, you might have a data collection that has you know, millions or more items of data. Now, in the case where you don't have labels, which we're not gonna talk that much about, um, there is still a function phi and there is, you, there is still, there could still be a parameterization X of the function phi, but the, phi, the, the purpose of phi in that case, where there are no labels, might be to assign each AJ to a cluster or a subspace. So to do the mapping that takes you from the AJ into the uh, correct cluster or the appropriate cluster for that AJ or the appropriate subspace. So this whole process, the process of finding this mapping phi is what's called learning. So that's where machine learning comes from, uh, the term machine learning, also called training. And this data is often called the training data. This is the data that you've got to work with to learn this function. Okay, so what's the purpose of this function? What do we do with this function when we've figured it out from the training set? Well, we can use it to make predictions. So now that I figured out what X is, what the appropriate value of the function parameterization is, if I come along with a new feature vector AK that maybe wasn't an element of the training set, but maybe looks similar to something in the training set, I wanna be able to plug that AK into this function phi parameterized by X, and it will make a prediction of the label YK. So hopefully in image classification, you'll give it an image that maybe is a monkey and there have been you know, hundreds of monkeys in the training set. This doesn't exactly match with any of those hundreds of monkey pictures in the training set, but it looks kind of similar to them. Hopefully, if you've done a good job of training, it will tell you that it's a monkey. It will give you the right label there. 
So that's one thing you can do with phi. The second thing you can do is to sort of analyze, uh, use phi to do some sort of analysis of the data set. So it could be that the phi or the parameter that defines phi reveals some structure in the data. So for example, it might tell you which components of the vector aj are the really important ones in deciding uh, what the yj is. So it could be that aj is a very long vector. You know, it could consist of all the pixels in an image, but you might learn that all the interesting information in the pictures in your training set are in the middle of that, uh, in, in the middle of the picture. So you can essentially ignore all the pixels that correspond to the periphery of the picture. So that might be something that if you uh, do a good job of the training, uh, that might be something that you can deduce from the structure of the function phi that's learned from the data set. So it might also learn some sort of hidden structure. So it might learn the low dimensional subspaces that contain the AJs, it might find the clusters. Uh, it might also give you intuition about how you get from the AJ to the YJ. So we're not gonna talk about decision trees at all. Decision trees are a very classical um, uh, technique in machine learning that go way back, I think to the 60s and 70s. Um, you can program up, this, you can express decision trees as integer programming problems. But one nice thing about decision trees is it gives you sort of an intuitive way of getting from the AJ to the YJ. So it might ask you a bunch of questions about sort of yes, no questions about the AJ and give you a systematic way of getting from uh, the, the features to the, to the label. Now, there are many uh, possible compl uh, complications in doing uh, data science or doing training. One is that even after you've done your best to sort of clean up the data, there still might be a lot of errors in the AJ. So that if you're looking at images, AJ images, there might be noise in the image. There might be some sort of distortion or blurring or something. Um, there might be some missing pixels. Uh, there might be something obscuring a chunk of the image from your view. Someone puts their finger in front of the camera or something like that. There can also be errors in the label. Uh, whoever came up with the labels might have messed things up. They might have accidentally typed in the wrong labels for the, for the wrong image, or there might have, might have been some other malfunction. You might have an adversary that's deliberately trying to mess you up and has actually corrupted some of the, uh, some of the images or some of the features. There might be missing data. So there might be, as I said, there might be uh, uh, elements of the AJ that are not there. Um, there might be problems where you know some of the labels YJ, but not all of them. Um, and you sort of have to figure out what the missing labels are. That's not as difficult as it sounds often. Another issue that's actually come to the fore again in recent times is overfitting. So this is a classical issue in statistics that uh, there's this danger that you might overfit the training data. You might learn a very complicated function that does a great job, maybe a perfect job of fitting the training data, but it doesn't do very well when you give it another piece of data that looks like the training data, but actually isn't in the training set. So that's classically called overfitting. And the way that's typically been dealt with is not to, uh, not to do too got a job of fitting or to do fitting that isn't perfect, but gives you some sort of simple um, mapping phi. So that's a sort of classical view of this issue. But one of the big sort of discoveries of the last five years or five or 10 years in neural nets is that, or maybe the last five years to be safe, um, is that, that that conventional wisdom has sort of gone out the window largely. People have discovered that uh, you can train over parameterized neural nets to perfectly fit the training set, and yet they will still do a good job sometimes uh, on out of sample data. And, uh, and uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, incredibly smart people working to understand why that's the case. And I'll touch on a couple of theories that have been developed um, as to uh, uh, why overfitting seems to be not so much of an issue uh, anymore, flying in the face of some of the conventional wisdom and statistics. Another complication that you can have is so-called distributional shift. So your training data might have been all captured in one regime, but you might want to make predictions in other regimes. And so um, obviously you can't expect to do a perfect job, but hopefully um, you know what, what you have learned in the old regime might still be somewhat relevant. Okay, so probably don't have to sell this audience on this, that uh, optimization is a major source of algorithms for machine learning and data analysis. I'm going to, going to be focusing on continuous optimization. There is a place for discrete optimization. There are 
a lot of very smart discrete optimization people that are um, uh, applying uh, their techniques to um, machine learning in various ways. But I'll just make the point that optimization, it, it's not just the algorithms in optimization that's important, but it's the formulation techniques. We have a lot of experience or users of optimization in, in many domains have a lot of experience at translating engineering scientific principles into objective functions and constraints. And of course, you can do that with statistical principles as well. Principles like risk, likelihood, significance, generalizability, and so on. You can use statistics to distill those into quantifiable functions that you, you can then turn into objectives and constraints in an optimization problem. Uh, of course, we have algorithms, and that's what we're going to be talking about quite a lot. I'll just make the point here that often it's not just a matter of calling F min con in MATLAB and expecting that to do a good job, because often real problems in data science are extremely large scale, and uh, you can't just use a black box approach and expect to get good answers. Um, sometimes you can, and if you, if you can, then that's great. Uh, but sometimes uh, you, you have to sort of dig deeper and use customized specialized approaches. Um, uh, duality has uh, got a, a bit of a role to play in machine learning, uh, certainly in classical ML. We'll talk about kernel learning where duality is kind of a critical tool. Non-smoothness has a lot to, to do with it as well, particularly nowadays neural nets are non-smooth functions of their inputs and so and of their weights. And so um, uh, uh, it shows up a lot. It also shows up as a, as a tool in classical formulations to promote generalizability. So you can introduce, as we'll see very soon, you can introduce non-smoothness into objective functions as a way of forcing you to get a simple answer to the data fitting problem. And in that case, it often arises in a highly structured way that can be exploited by methods. So machine learning has had an influence on continuous optimization uh, in the way that we do research and optimization. It's brought some issues to the fore. It's made other issues kind of less important. So one thing that's really brought to the fore is this idea of computational complexity. Now, this concept of oracle complexity was uh, kind of invented by Polyak and uh, uh, Nemirovsky and Yudin um, uh, for at least 40 years ago. There's a famous book of Nemirovsky and Yudin from 1983 that describes the concept in great detail. But I would say most Western optimization people didn't really pay much attention to it with the exception of when uh, interior point methods came along in the 90s and we would all prove complexity results about interior point methods. But not many people are talking about complexity results for non-linear optimization problems. But when machine learning people came along, a lot of them sort of had their roots or they had interests in theoretical computer science where complexity is, is sort of a bread and butter issue. And so it sort of brought that issue to the fore as a way of comparing different algorithms, uh, you know, you, you can sort of get complexity results of different methods and use them as, as a way to, uh, to compare and, co and contrast them. Um, one thing that's probably less interesting, uh, you know, I'm from the generation where we would often prove local convergence rates about methods. So we'd prove things about quasi Newton methods being super linearly convergent and Newton's method being quadratically convergent and so on. Um, these are of less interest in machine learning because often uh, they're, they're sort of only interested, uh, the, the local convergence rates only cut in when the problem is essentially solved. And so they're much more interested in the regime before you get to the local convergence domain. And so that, that issue is kind of not as important in the machine learning context. Another, uh, you know, related question is that they prefer cheap approximate solutions over expensive accurate solutions. Um, uh, that was certainly true uh, before the dream of training over-parameterized neural nets to do perfect zero loss came along. But certainly when in the era of kernel learning, logistic regression, classification, all that kind of thing, people were not aiming to get solutions accurate to seven digits. So we're happy with approximate solutions. And this is another reason why local conversions wasn't that much of an issue. Uh, and another uh, uh, point to note is that these are often very, very big problems. So the um, number of variables in modern neural nets is now in the trillions on some neural networks. Um, uh, and the uh, number of uh, the amount of data, the number of training items in the training set, that can also be extremely large. So uh, right now, people that are doing self-driving cars 
uh, are continually collecting data from people that are driving these cars around neighborhoods. Tesla's continue collecting video data from their users. And these are uh, being learned to train the neural nets that, that are used in the um, uh, 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 automatic driving systems. And so obviously the collection of images you've got to work with there is you know, probably in the billions by now. And so this means that you know, we've got very large, very difficult optimization problems. We need to use parallel methods often. I'm gonna say very little about that during these sessions. Um, also, just the process of evaluating a function or a gradient is often beyond the reach. Uh, you just don't have the computational power to get an exact uh, functional gradient evaluation. So you have to be able to make do with some sort of approximation. And we'll see many examples of that. Uh, another point here is the, the use of the term algorithm. So it, I sort of realized five or six years ago that machine learning people were using the term algorithm in a slightly different way from optimization people. So machine learning, the algorithm is, is used to denote the process that maps the training data, which I'll call S here, that's a collection of M pairs of training data, to a predictor, which is the function phi, okay? Um, that whole process of going from the training data to the predictor is what's called the algorithm. And what they aim for, what they, they decide an algorithm is good, you know, if it's fairly efficient, I suppose, but secondly, if it does a good job of generalizability, which I've talked about a bit already. So I won't, I won't talk about it again. Now, that's not exactly what we mean by an algorithm in optimization. In optimization, we sort of think of two stages. We think of taking the problem, writing down a formulation, which has got objective function constraints, whatever, and then solving that formulation using an algorithm. So there's sort of a two-stage process, okay? And so the responsibility for getting a good result, when, you, when you're using this two-stage process to solve a machine learning problem, the responsibility for getting a good, uh, a good um, algorithm from an ML point of view, that is one with good generalizability, it falls on both stages of this process. It mean, it, to get good generalizability, you need to do a good job of formulation as well as a good job of solving the problem. And I sort of claim that this is a bit unfair on the optimization algorithm, okay? It sort of overloads the algorithm. Traditionally in optimization, we've thought of the formulation as being given to us, as being presented to us from on high. And as long as we do a great job of minimizing the function um, subject to the constraints, we're happy, okay? We figure we've done our job. But sometimes we present that solution to the ML people and they'll say, oh, this one, this doesn't generalize very well. Your algorithm wasn't any good. And we sort of object, our algorithm solved the problem that you gave us. So you have to do a better job of formulating the problem, okay? And so the point I'm making here is that it's not just the, the algorithm anymore, it's about the formulation as well as the algorithm. And this really requires the, in, the input and expertise of, of um, uh, you know, people in machine learning and people that work in the applications, okay? But there are, there are algorithmic ramifications for this issue as well. Um, because we can ask, sometimes um, there are properties of the solution that we're looking for that might give better generalization, uh, uh, that might have ge better generalization properties than other possible solutions. For example, if the optimization uh, formulation that you're trying to solve it might have multiple local minima, but you might know or you might suspect that some of these local minima with certain properties are going to do a better job at generalizability than others. And there's a lot of speculation. This is still a current area of research, but there's a lot of speculation about low curvature solutions, for example. So if you have a non-convex problem, um, there's reason to suspect that low curvature solutions, for example, when that non-convex problem is coming from a neural net, there's reasons, to, or from a, a matrix optimization problem, there's reasons to suspect that, that solutions with low curvature have better properties from a machine learning point of view than, uh, uh, than, you know, uh, problem, than solutions with high curvature. But this is still not a settled question. Okay. All right. Uh, I've used this slide quite a lot before, but uh, as far as I know, this picture is still online. This is... Uh, this was a thing I found online first about four years ago. SAS, this, this company that does statistical software, um, uh, put this cheat sheet online and it was for people who had some sort of data science problem and they were trying to figure out what tool they needed to use to analyze their data. And it asked them a bunch of questions about what are you trying to do? 
And, and the idea was you could work through this, this tree, you could answer these yes, no questions. You could say whether speed or accuracy was more important or whatever. And you'd end up in one of these um, uh, blue boxes and that would tell you uh, what technique you needed to use to analyze your data. And when I looked at this, I was pleasantly surprised to find that many of these blue boxes involved some sort of optimization in some way. So, and th these are the ones that I've circled in yellow. So for example, kernel SVM is right here. Neural networks is here. Uh, sparse principal components is here somewhere. Singular value decomposition. Well, of course that's numerical uh, linear algebra, but you can solve it using optimization. So I'll claim that for optimization. You could even claim that some of the, the red things are kind of have large components of optimization as well. So there's some Bayesian optimization, there's k-means, uh, people use optimization type methods for that. So there's an awful lot of optimization here. Okay, so it is really a central area. Okay, so I'm gonna start diving into these 15 applications. Most of them I've just got one or maybe two slides about. And these are uh, problems in uh, data science, some of them classical, some of them quite new that give rise to optimization formulations. And I'm not gonna talk about the algorithms here. I'm just gonna get as far as writing down what the formulation, the optimization formulation looks like. So the first one is extremely classical. It's linear least squares. So here you'll recognize this notation that I had from earlier slides, that a feature vectors aj, which in this case are just real vectors. And the labels yj here are, are just are real numbers, scalars. This goes back to Gauss and Lejeune, more than 200 years. And we're trying to learn a linear predictor. In other words, we're imposing some structure on this prediction function phi. Okay, so we want phi to be a linear combination of the elements of aj. So essentially what we're trying to learn is this vector x so that aj transpose x is approximately equal to yj. Okay, and how are we going to uh, figure out the optimal x? Well, we can form a sum of squares of the errors, the difference between the prediction, which is aj transpose x, and the observation, which is the yj. So we can just square that difference, sum up the squares. So you'll notice this structure here where there's m terms in the sum, one for each item in the data set. And that gives us, a, a, you could call it an optimization problem. You could also call it a numerical linear algebra problem. But certainly it gives us a function that we can minimize to find in some sense the best x. Now, you remember I talked about finding, we might be interested in finding x's that do a pretty good job of making a x j transpose x equals y, but also have some additional properties. So for example, you might want an x that has a, a smaller two norm. That makes it in some sense less sensitive to noise in the yj's. And this has been around for ages. This is Tikhonov regularization. So this was in my thesis in the 80s, but it, it dates back to well before that. You can add on a small multiple of the two norm of x squared. And now you have, well, it's still a linear algebra problem at this point, but it, it looks like an optimization problem. Another thing that's more recent, this dates to uh, Tip Shirani's lasso from uh, 1997, is this idea of adding on a multiple of the one norm. Now this really is an optimization problem. You can't solve this problem using uh, linear algebra. Um, this was very big about 15 years ago in the area of compressed sensing was in its heyday. And as, you, as probably many of you know, solving this problem, you tend to get a sparse vector X. You tend to get an X that contains a lot of zeros in it. And this is actually very useful statistically because the locations of the zeros in X tell you which elements of AJ don't really matter in predicting the YJ. So you can line up X against the AJ. They both have the same length. And if the X only has non-zeros here and here and here, what that's telling you is that the only three elements of AJ that are useful in predicting YJ are the three corresponding elements in those same locations of the aj vector so that's you know that's the usefulness of adding on a multiple of the one norm and the bigger you make lambda of course the more sparse you make x bigger lambda corresponds to fewer non-zeros in the solution x so you know when i got involved in compressed sensing it's almost 20 years ago now uh we put a lot of effort into well i guess 15 years ago we put a lot of effort into solving that problem Second application, robust linear regression. So this is really just a generalization of what I had on the previous slide, except 
except that we can replace the sum of squares function with some other kind of loss function. It could be logistic, logistic regression. It could be some uh, so-called uh, Hoover estimate. Hoover estimation, it looks like least squares when you're close to the solution, and then it turns into L1. Sorry, it looks like it looks like a square when you're close to zero, but then it looks like L1 when you're further away from zero, absolute value. Also the regularization term, instead of being a two norm squared or a one norm, that could be something fancier. It could be maybe some non-convex function. Um, it could be something called SCAD or MCP, which are like the L1 norm, but, uh, have, uh, but are also non-convex and have certain appealing statistical properties. So in a sense, you can generalize uh, this least squares problem in a lot of interesting statistically interesting ways and give yourself interesting optimization problems to solve. Uh, another way to generalize linear least squares is this whole area of matrix sensing or matrix completion. And the interesting thing or the perspective we observe here is that we take the X, which is sort of the, the parameter of the, of the mapping phi, we take this to be the unknown and we think of the AJs as operators that probe X. So each of these AJs might be a linear combination of elements of X, for example. And that linear combination will give rise to the observation YJ. So once again, we can, we can form a sum of squares objective by, by squaring the difference between the prediction, AJ operating on X, and the observation, which is the YJ. We square that, we sum them up, and we get ourselves a, uh, we get ourselves a least squares problem, essentially. But the twist here is that the X isn't a vector, it's a matrix. And very often the number of observations is not going to be enough to determine all the elements of that matrix. So to make it, so in other words, this problem might have a, a tremendously large subspace of solutions. So we might be interested in the simplest solution. Okay. What's the simplest X that will fit the data? So of course it depends on what your concept of simplicity is, but one powerful concept of simplicity is low rank. So we might be interested in finding an X that's low rank and does a pretty good job of, of fitting the observations. So there was this um, uh, very important paper by Rect, uh, uh, Perillo and uh, Fazel uh, that appeared in CIREV in 2010, where they sort of invented this area of um, uh, matrix completion. And the way they formulated the problem was to take this objective and add on lambda times the nuclear norm. The nuclear norm is the sum of singular values of X. X here is non-symmetric, so these singular values are real. Uh, and it turns out this gives you a convex formulation that under certain assumptions, assumptions on the uh, properties of the uh, operators AJ uh, or whatever, uh, it will give you a low rank solution uh, to, the, um, uh, to the matrix completion problem. There are many variants on this. Um, important contributions in algorithms and so on in many other areas. One very important uh, generalization or, or reformulation of this problem is, is one that avoids the following issue. The issue is that very often the matrix you want to work with here is huge. It might have thousands of rows, it might have thousands of columns. And so you're talking potentially about uh, problems with millions of variables and the uh, techniques you use to solve this formulation just don't work on problems that big. They're just too computationally intensive. So people ask the question very early on, well, look, if we know that, that we're only looking for a low rank solution to X, let's write the X as a low rank matrix to begin with. And just, just write it as the outer product of two long skinny matrices. It's called an L and R transpose, okay? Let's write the X as the product of L times R transpose. And instead of X being a nonlinear problem, let L and R be the unknowns in the problem and minimize that function over the L and the R. Now, this is very interesting, but, uh, and it's obviously got many fewer variables in it than the problem with all of X in it, but the difficulty is that it's non-convex, okay? Unlike this previous formulation, which is convex. But very surprisingly, and this has been something that's kind of really blown up since about 2015, despite the non-convexity, it turns out that for many interesting instances of this problem, you can run fairly naive algorithms like gradient descent and find a global minimum or find a useful solution. In other words, they don't seem to get stuck at local minima. Or when they do, there might be a lot of local minima, but they might, might all be sort of equally valid. They might all be low rank solutions. So this has been uh, 
this this was a bit of a revelation because you know those of us that come from an optimization background when people presented us with non-convex problems we sort of thought well sorry but these might have a lot of local solutions all we can guarantee you is that we're going to find the local solution finding the global solution is just too hard we can come up with interesting heuristics to do that like multi-start and uh and smoothing and various other things that people have tried over the years but there's no way we'll get a rigorous guarantee that we'll find your global minimum. Well, it turns out there are large swathes of problems in machine learning where although the problem's non-convex, it's a sort of trackable non-convex problem. It's not so, not so hard to solve. And I'll say a little bit more about that at the end of the slide deck. Okay, fourth application. This is just a little bit of a variation on this low rank uh, matrix completion problem non-negative matrix factorization. It's got a lot of interesting applications in these areas. Uh, genomics, uh, I've actually worked recently with people in genomics that had problems like this. And this is just like matrix completion, except it's got the added restriction um, that the elements of L and R, the two factors of X, uh, need to be non-negative. And there might be additional structure as well. So one of the applications I worked on a couple of years ago was that we wanted the R to have disjoint support. There was a, a genomics person uh, that I collaborated with, um, and she had that requirement that she wanted the, the R's to be disjoint. So we had to play all sorts of tricks uh, to make sure with the formulation to give R that property. Okay, number five. This one's interesting because it's got to do with networks. And networks are a very big area these days of sort of modern data science. And I'm not going to talk too much about them. I'm really only going to be able to cover a little corner of, of data science. But but there's a whole swathe of data science that deals with networks. This is one problem. We can sort of think of, um, we can think of having a bunch of say P random variables uh, in each, uh, sorry, e yeah, sorry. Uh, we have a random variable vector, which has length P. So each, each component of Z is a random variable. And we've got N draws of these random variables. We're drawing, we're drawing N of these Z's from some distribution. What we're trying to figure out are what are the relationships between the components of Z? So there are P components of Z, they're, they're related, they're often correlated. So component one might move sort of, might be somehow correlated to component four. Component two might be correlated to component six and so on. Now, generally they're all gonna be correlated. They're all gonna be, have some sort of you know, positive or negative correlation. But what we're looking for is a dependency graph between the components of Z, okay? So in a sense, we're looking, so here's a case where P equals six. We're looking to find, uh, given two components of Z, we're looking to find whether they influence each other directly, whether they're correlated directly in some sense, or whether the correlation can be explained by the correlations with some other set, uh, other components of Z. So for example, here, five and six in this graph, the arc between five and six is telling us that Variables five and six are directly correlated to each other. I can't explain the relationship between the fifth and sixth components without, without um, uh, you know, I, I can't explain it in terms of what's happening with the other four components. On the other hand, uh, uh, components two and five are correlated in some way, but the relationship between two and five is fully explained by the fact that they're both mutually related to components three and four. So it might be surprising that by looking at a bunch of examples or looking at uh, 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 instances of the random vector Z, we can actually figure out this, um, uh, this dependency. And it turns out the dependency is the inverse of the covariance, of the covariance uh, uh, that, that describes the correlation between the different components of Z. So what we can do is form a sample covariance, take our n draws of Z, form the sample covariance matrix in the classic way, and then take its inverse, okay? Now that doesn't work. In general, the sample covariance matrix is pretty much always dense. The inverse is generally gonna be dense as well, but we can sort of do some extra uh, stuff in the formulation to find a matrix X that's close to being the inverse of S, but is also sparse, okay? And this formulation will do the trick. This dates back to about 2008 by a bunch of statisticians. In fact, these guys published their result. This is Dash Bremont and Michael Jordan and someone else. I'm sorry, I forget who, but they published a result in SIM optimization and won a best paper prize uh, that year. It was one of the 
first uses of uh, optimization solving matrix uh, matrix or matrix uh, uh, you know problems in statistics. So by minimizing by plugging in the sample covariance here by minimizing this over x, we'll very often get a sparse matrix, and the locations of the non-zeros in that sparse matrix will tell us where the arcs are in the in the uh, in the network. Okay, so this is just one of many problems in network analysis. I've got another one coming up later on. Okay, here's something else you can do with a with a sparse with a sample covariance matrix. I guess I'll just talk for another four minutes or so, and then give people a few minutes to answer questions. So uh, to ask questions. So sparse PCA. This has been a big thing for a long time. Again, we're working with a sample covariance matrix S, and we want to find the leading. Uh, in a sense, a leading eigenvector, the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue of S. But we want it, we also want it to be sparse, okay? So we want a sparse approximation to the leading eigenvector. So it turns out you can write that, you can write down at least a convex relaxation of this problem by saying, let's find um, uh, the vector V that maximizes V transpose SV, subject to having unit norm, of course, we want all our vectors to have unit norm, but we also like it to have fewer than k non-zero elements. So this is the so-called zero norm. This just counts up the number of non-zeros in, in V. Now, this is not a tractable problem, okay? We can't solve an optimization problem like this unless we bring in discrete variables. But what was done in this paper, again by Dashpremont, was that they realized you could come up with a convex uh, relaxation of this problem. You could replace VV transpose by some n by n positive semi-definite matrix. And you can impose constraints on that matrix that made it likely that it would have rank one, okay? So you can insist that it have a trace of one, you can insist that it be positive semi-definite, just like this matrix is. And you could put a constraint on its one norm. The one norm here is just the, the, the infinity norm. Uh, it's just the sum of absolute values of elements of n. And by squeezing down this R, you could sort of make the rank of, often you could make the rank of M smaller and smaller and end up with, you know, a rank one matrix that would give you a decent approximation to V under certain circumstances. You can also do this if you're looking not just for the leading uh, sparse principal eigen, uh, eigenvector, but maybe the first R principal eigenvectors. So then you could bring in, um, uh, you could uh, bring in an explicit low rank formulation of that problem. You could, you could form a matrix F that's N by R, okay? And you could uh, maximize the inner product of S with FF transpose subject to certain constraints that sort of uh, make it reasonably likely that you will get sparse, uh, that this matrix S will be sparse and also that it will capture the R dimensional leading eigenspace of S fairly well, okay? So these are several examples of matrix uh, optimization problem. And maybe one more, um, this is sparse plus low rank. So this is uh, sometimes called robust PCA. So this is for the case where you've got a matrix Y and you sort of know from the nature of the application that Y is a product of um, a low rank matrix, which we'll call M and a sparse matrix, oh, sorry, it's a sum of a low rank matrix and a sparse matrix. So this sort of thing appears a lot in, in uh, video processing, where the background of every frame of the video is the same, but different things are happening in the foreground. So the background is the low rank part, and the foreground is the sparse part. These are just transitory things that only appear in the video for a second, you know, maybe a second of a four hour video. So it, it uh, you know, it's just, it, you can think of it as being sparse. So you can write that problem like this, the different ways to formulate it. This is sort of a convex formulation where you introduce M as the proxy for the low rank part. You try to minimize its, its uh, nuclear norm, which tends to give it a low rank. And for the S, you can, you can uh, try to minimize the one norm. And that sort of forces S to be sparse, subject to this constraint. Now, again, this is going to be a very big problem. Again, the matrix Y that you're dealing with here might be absolutely enormous, huge number of rows and or columns. And so you might want to explicitly parameterize uh, the M as an outer product of LR transpose. We've seen that trick a few times now and solve this non-convex problem. That's another way of doing it. Okay, I think I'll quit here and just pick it up here uh, tomorrow. So uh, thanks very much for your attention.
attention and I'm happy to answer any uh, questions. Thanks very much, Steve. So about halfway through the application, 